Now then, hello folks and welcome back to my video gaming channel, Retro Gamer Diaries. So, today we're going to talk about Sega's Space Harrier. Fantastic. By 1985, two years after the video gaming market crash, the arcade scene had started its own sales decline. Its golden age had already hit its peak and innovation started to plateau between 1982 and 1984 and gamers were starting to lose interest. And this certainly wasn't helped with Nintendo launching the Nintendo Entertainment System into our homes and placing gamers in front of their TV sets rather than the arcade screens. However, with the help of companies such as Midway, Capcom and Sega, the arcade environment started to improve with a new rise of interest peaking in the 90s. And although Sega had its own home console, the Master System, it was not really a challenge to Nintendo's dominant NES. However, unlike its home success, in the arcades it was Sega that ruled the kingdom. Sega was the king. Sega continued to push the arcade agenda with new innovation and cutting edge graphics. And one key man behind Sega's success at the time was Yu Suzuki, a young programmer and designer whose previous success included championship boxing and the very popular and brilliant Hang On. Hang On used hardware with superscalar technology that allowed three dimensional sprite texture scaling at high frame rates. It was also the first to use 16 bit graphics. Pretty good at its time, I have to say. After the success of his Hang On game, Yu Suzuki was looking for his next arcade blockbuster. And that game is Space Harrier. Space Harrier was first conceived by a Sega designer named Ida, who wrote a 100 page document proposing the idea of a three dimensional shooter that contained the word Harrier in the title. The game originally featured a player-controlled fighter jet that shot missiles into a realistic foreground. However, this is a concept that was soon rejected due to the extensive work required to project the aircraft realistically from various angles as it moved around the screen, coupled with arcade machines' memory limitations. Yu Suzuki therefore simplified the title character to a human, which required less memory and realism to depict on screen. He then rewrote the entire original proposal, changing the style of the game to a science fiction setting while keeping only the Harrier name. Yu Suzuki's game design was inspired from a number of sources, such as the 1984 film The Never Ending Story. The main character in the game was also inspired by the 1982 anime series Space Cobra. The backgrounds of the game was also inspired by the artist Roger Dean. Certain enemies were modelled on characters from the anime series Gundam. It's also quite amusing, but Suzuki also included a nod to the original designer in the finished product with an enemy character called Ida, a large mole-like floating stone head, because the designer also had a really big head apparently. And then Space Harrier was released in the arcades in 1985. What a game. Welcome to the fantasy zone. Get ready. Running on the Sega Space Harrier arcade system board, previously used in Suzuki's 1985 arcade debut, Hang On. Space Harrier was one of the first arcade releases to use 16-bit graphics and scaled sprite, also known as super scalar technology, that allowed pseudo 3D sprite scaling at high frame rates with the ability to display 32,000 colors on screen. Pretty impressive. Three different arcade cabinets were produced, an upright cabinet, a sit-down version with a fixed seat and its best-known incarnation, a deluxe cockpit-style rolling cabinet that was mounted on a motorised base and moved dependent on the direction in which players pushed the joystick. Sega were very hesitant to have these cabinets built due to the high construction costs. However, Suzuki, who had proposed the cabinet designs, offered his salary as compensation if the game failed. 
but as we know, it went on to become a major hit in the arcades. What a hero. Space Harrier also utilised an analogue flight stick as its controller that allowed on-screen movement in all directions, while the velocity of the character's flight is unchangeable. The degree of push and acceleration varies depending on how far the stick is moved in a certain direction. Two separate fire buttons are mounted on the joystick and on the control panel. Either one can be pressed repeatedly in order to shoot at enemies. Again, all of this added to the thrill of the game. The game's soundtrack is also by Hiroshi Kabaguchi. Hope I said his name right. He's basically another legend that Yuzuzuki is used in quite a lot of his games such as OutRun. Space Harrier is like no other game. It's fast paced, set in a surreal world composed of brightly coloured landscapes adorned with checkerboard style grounds and stationary objects such as trees and stone pillars. It's such a great game. At the start of the gameplay, players are greeted with a voice sample speaking Welcome to the Fantasy Zone, get ready, in addition to You're Doing Great with the successful completion of a stage. The title player, simply named Harrier, navigates a continuously series of 18 distinct stages while utilising an underarm jet-propelled laser cannon that enables Harrier to simultaneously fly and shoot. The objective is simply to destroy all enemies, who range from prehistoric animals and Chinese dragons to flying robots, airborne geometric objects and alien pods, all while remaining in constant motion in order to dodge projectiles and immovable ground obstacles. 15 of the game's 18 stages contain a boss at the end that must be killed in order to progress to the next level. The final stage is a rush of 7 past bosses encountered up to that point that appear individually and are identified by the name at the bottom of the screen. The other two levels are bonus stages that contain no enemies and where Harrier mounts on an invincible cat-like dragon named Yuria, whom the player manoeuvres to smash through landscape obstacles and collect bonus points. This definitely has that certain influence from that never-ending story. Space Harrier was a commercial success in the arcades, becoming one of Japan's top two highest grossing upright cockpit arcade games in 1986, along with Sega's Hang On. Critically praised for its innovative graphics, gameplay and motion cabinet, Space Harrier is often ranked among Suzuki's best works. Space Harrier has been ported over to home computer and gaming platforms either by Sega or outside developers. Most of these early translations were unable to reproduce the original's advanced visual or audio capabilities while the controls were switched from analogue to digital. Two home system sequels followed in Space Harrier 3D and Space Harrier 2, both of which were released in 1988. There was also an arcade spin-off Planet Harriers which was released in 2000 which we'll look at also. So in total this video covers 46 Space Harrier games across all the many formats. Blimey, so let's buckle up and let's start by looking at the Master System port. Sega challenges you with the ultimate video game, the Sega Master System, with twice as much memory as any other video game. Advanced video technology like scrolling backgrounds, graphics in 64 colors, digital sounds, and light phasers. Fresh. And you can add to the excitement with sports pads, control sticks, and the first video games ever in 3D. Sega's the one. The Sega Master System. The challenge will always be there. Okay, the first port was released in 1986 for the Master System, also known as Mark III in Japan. This is the first 2 megabit cartridge produced for the console. Instead of the fantasy zone, the game is given a plot in which Harrier saves the land of the dragons. So all 18 stages were present, but the backdrops had been removed, leaving just a monochromatic horizon and the checkboard floors. The pace of the game has been stifled quite a bit for the 8-bit machine to keep up, and the scrolling is much choppier. Still, the huge enemies managed to impress. For the most part, the enemies and labels are comparable to the arcade version. Sega added in an additional final boss named Heia-O, named after the Heia-O Nakayama, 
the then president of Sega. Blimey, me, I'm not good at these Japanese names. I hope I said that right as well. This version also had a real ending, which is much better than the arcade version, which simply showed up as a huge The End sign. And also hidden is the ability to play as a jet fighter, and a secret message that urges players to write to Sega given their opinions. Let's have a look at the game. The Commodore 64 received two conversions in 1986. One originated in the UK by Elite and the other from the USA by Sega. For me, the UK version of the Commodore 64 is too fast and choppy, although the music is decent enough I suppose. The USA version is slightly better, being that the floor has a scrolling effect whereas it's just a solid colour in the UK release. The ZX Spectrum port was developed by Elite and published in Europe in 1986. As with many arcade conversions to this system, Space Harrier suffers from the limited available palette and lack of high quality sound. The game is sluggish and hideously coloured. The patterns make it somewhat hard on the eyes, which makes the gameplay very awkward. However, we have to remember this is a ZX Spectrum. Despite these limitations, it is a pretty good effort for the hardware nonetheless. The Amstrad port was also developed by Elite and published in Europe in 1986. The Amstrad version achieves a high frame rate and a good degree of playability by sacrificing the use of sprites in favour of line drawn graphics reminiscent of vector games common in arcades in the early 80s. Only the Harrier himself is fully drawn as a sprite. All other enemies and obstacles are presented as wireframes. The Space Harrier versions on the NEC PC 6001 and also the 8801 were developed by Denpa and published in Japan in 1987. They're not very good. While the Harrier is a low colour sprite, everything else, including the clouds, trees and bullets are just featureless coloured rectangles. And yet, despite how awful it looks, it keeps up the speed and actually plays more smoothly than most of the European computer ports.
The FM7 was developed by Denpa and published in Japan in 1987. It does make a few visual sacrifices to accommodate what the hardware is capable of. However, overall, it does play reasonably faithful to the arcade original. Let's have a look at three games developed for three sharp computers, the MZ700, the X1 and the 68000. The sharp MZ700 version was originally a fan made game, which was released in a Japanese magazine and then later licensed by Sega and released in 1988. The game was poor due to the low resolution. All graphics are displayed in text format. Wow. Everything looked like coloured blotches and it really does hurt your eyes. I suppose if you squint your eyes or watch it from the back of the room you can almost see that it is actually Space Harrier. The Sharp X1, also known as the CZ800C, was also developed by Denpa and published in Japan in 1988. This is certainly an upgrade to its MZ700 cousin. Unlike the PC8801 version, some sacrifices were made in order to make the game playable on this system. The Space Harrier is rendered in full high resolution. And the enemies are single colour bitmaps that scale fairly well but only appear in white. And the terrain obstacles, shots, both yours and the enemies, with the explosions, are rendered as largely scaled pixels that are quite difficult to see until they get close enough.
Now, the X68000 port was published in 1987, again by Denpa in Japan. And like many arcade conversions created by the 68K, the conversion is nearly arcade perfect with very little changed about the game at all. The most significant change is the switch from the checkerboard terrain featured in the arcade to a more linear terrain which does an equally good job conveying a sense of motion. The 68K version also features Hiya O, the Sega Master System ending and a new credit sequence along with two music tracks. The NEC, Avenue and Dempa brought the Space Hire to the PC engine, also known as the Turbo Graphics 16 in Japan in 1988. It was later published in North America in 1990. It's smoother than the other 8-bit console ports, but it still doesn't feel quite right. Again, it makes some sacrifices due to the lower screen resolution, and it switches the checkerboard terrain from lines like the Sharp 68000 version. Developed by Elite and published in Europe in 1988 and also published by Sega in North America in 1988. The Atari ST is visually faithful, but ultimately a sluggish conversion of the game. For some reason, the game features an image of a barbarian along the right side of the screen throughout the game. This is visually similar to the DOS release also.
Okay, now we're on that DOS IBM PC version, which was developed by David Mattern and Brian Rice and published only in North America by Sega in 1989. This version is nearly identical in look and frame rate as the Atari ST version, right down to the incorporation of that barbarian artwork ever present on the right side of the screen. However, it features far less faithful sound, making use only of one channel. The Amiga port was also developed by Elite and published in Europe in 1989 and also by Sega in North America in 1989. It's an unusual move, this version is not really a carbon copy of the Atari ST version, which was a common practice at this time. Rather, this version is faithful to the arcade in both look and feel, as it appears to achieve a more consistent frame rate during play. It also makes use of the entire screen, unlike the Atari ST version. It's also worth noting that both the Amiga and the Atari ST games were split into two separate games, Space Harrier and Space Harrier Return to the Fantasy Zone. Okay, the Famicom port was developed by Whiteboard and published in Japan by Takara in 1989. Okay, the scrolling is smoother than the Sega Master System port, but the Harrier moves incredibly slowly. There's a whole bunch of flicker and all the sprites are smaller. This port makes a lot of sacrifices both to the visuals and gameplay to enable the game to run, but what is present is done with a good amount of quality. The sound is simplistic and the game limits the number of moving enemies on the screen. However, even with this limitation in place, the game still suffers from slowdown occasionally. 
The enemy arrangement is based on the Master System version, so it has the additional final boss. So that's a bonus point, I suppose. Developed and published by Sega around the world in 1991, the Game Gear port is based on the Master System release. Due to the smaller screen size, some of the proportions had to be changed, so the Harrier is much bigger. The enemy sprites have been altered to appear more organic. Some of the level names have been changed as well, as there are only 12 stages in total. And a password function also allows players to skip to later levels. I quite like that feature actually. Despite running on the same hardware as the Master System, the music has been rearranged also. Let's have a look at the game. Okay, now we're on the Sega 32X port. This port was developed by Rootable Games and published by Sega in 1994. It is widely considered to be the first truly arcade accurate conversion of the game to be released by Sega on the home console. Okay, I did mention that the Sharp 68K version was considerably accurate as well, but that was for a home computer and not a console game like this one. Now, I was a fan of the 32X version of Space Harrier, however, there was a drawback, and that is that the game only runs at 30 frames per second. <laughs> the 
The Sega Saturn version of Space Harrier was developed by Sega and published in Japan in 1996. It came out on a single disc in Japan and was bundled together with Outrun and Afterburner 2 for the Western release. It includes true analogue control to mimic the original arcade game. This is a pretty much arcade perfect port of the game. Although I was a big fan of the 32X version, the Sega Saturn version is better. The arcade version of Space Harrier is also included in the 1999 Dreamcast action adventure title Shenmue as a mini game and also as a full port in the 2001 sequel Shenmue 2. It is missing some of the customization options of the other ports, but if you can beat the game in one credit, you get a certificate from the arcade owner in the first Shenmue. Very good. Okay, now we're on to the Yu Suzuki Gameworks Volume 1 book. Released exclusively in Japan at the end of 2001, Gamesworks is a rather excellent collection of the classic arcade games created by Yu Suzuki. The package comprises of a disc containing 5 Sega arcade classics and a book that explains the history of the games, the development and the cabinets themselves. For the most part, Space Harrier is a fairly accurate conversion and it all plays good.
In 2003, a remake of the original Space Harrier was developed by Tamsoft as part of the Japanese Sega Ages Classic Games series for the PlayStation 2. This is also known as the Sega Classics Collection in North America and Europe. The graphics are composed of polygons instead of the sprites, while several characters are also redesigned and a selectable option allows players to switch to a fractal mode that replaces their traditional checkerboard floors with texture mapped playfields and also includes two new underground stages. There's also power-ups such as bombs and also a lock-on targeting thing, a bit like Panther Dragoon. For me, the whole makeover looks rather cheap with jaggy visuals and low resolution textures. The redesigned look of the Harrier is lousy with his silly goggles and spiky blonde hair. Their graphics lose much of their bright colour that made the original so attractive. But since the objects here are actual 3D objects instead of 2D sprites, it does give a better impression of depth and scale. In the original game, all the boss dragons were made out of individual segments that scrolled in unison, giving the illusion of a flying beast. And sadly, there's no option for the analog control. On a positive point, the remix music tracks are actually quite good, and the new announcer sprouts out more ridiculous phrases like Get Busy Harrier, Dragonlands is Screaming. And as I also mentioned, there's now a new lock-on laser similar to the Panzer Dragon, along with a limited use rapid fire button. And you can also get those bombs to clear the screen, but these make the boss battles far too easy in my opinion. So overall, I had mixed feelings about this port. However, I have to say, this is a budget game, so I don't think the expectations should be too high. And also, they made an attempt to make it different, so we'll give them that. The original Space Harrier was also packaged with three of Yu Suzuki's other works, Afterburner, Outrun and Super Hang On for the 2003 Game Boy Advance release Sega Arcade Gallery. And although it looks fine on the outset, it is actually badly programmed and just doesn't feel right. Now we're on Sega Ages 2500 Volume 2 Space Harrier Complete Collection which was released on the PlayStation 2. This is a nearly complete collection of all the ports and versions of the original Space Harrier and its sequels. It's compiled in emulated form to run on the PlayStation 2's hardware. It includes all versions of Space Harrier including the arcade, Sega Mass System and even the Game Gear. It has Space Harrier 2 and Space Harrier 3D for the Sega Master System also. No arranged versions are available but the collection features a host of emulated options nonetheless to fit the game to your tastes. Let's have a look at the arcade version of Space Harrier here. Yeah! <laughs> 
Space Harrier is also available as an unlockable game in Sonic's Ultimate Genesis Collection which was released in 2009 for the Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3. The game is okay but it does have sound emulation differences. Space Harrier on the Atari XL and XE was an unofficial port. The 8-bit Atari version of Space Harrier was not developed in the 80s when the game was popular, but rather in 2011, taken on a challenge by coder and graphics artist Chris Hutt, along with musician Sal Esquivel. I hope I said his name right. The result is pretty good and an achievement thought visually impossible. Naturally, the graphics take a bit of a hit when converting a 16-bit game to an 8-bit system. But HUT achieves a wider range of colours than typically available by rapidly switching between palettes each frame, making it difficult to capture the beauty of the image in a single snapshot. HUT also does a pretty good job with the digitised voices. The arcade version of Space Harrier was released on the Wii Virtual Console in 2012.
3D Space Harrier on the Nintendo 3DS was developed by Sega and published in Japan in 2012, and then a year later outside Japan. Space Harrier receives a 3D treatment in more ways than one. In addition to the game being presented in stereoscopic view, the screen itself is presented as part of the deluxe arcade system that used hydraulics to tilt the screen and the player in either direction, depending on how the player moved. It was quite good, so the screen tilts as if it would have been on the arcade, complete with simulated gear noises. And on top of that, Heya O is also included as the hidden final boss. Sega included an emulation of the original title as a mini-game in several titles of their Yakuza series, such as the 2015 release Yakuza 0 and the 2018 release Yakuza 6 The Song of Life. Just copying the Shenmue games in my opinion though. Fist of the North Star, Lost Paradise is an action role-playing video game released in 2018 for the PlayStation 4. Like Shenmue and the Yakuza games, you could also play various mini-games such as Outrun, Hang On and also our Space Harrier. I see. <laughs> Your invasion ends here! Space Harrier! Welcome to the panel, people. Get ready. Space Harrier was also re-released for the Nintendo Switch as part of the Sega Ages lineup. Let's have a look. Welcome to the family. Get ready.
Space Harrier spawned two home system sequels in 1988. There was Space Harrier 3D on the Sega Master System and there was also Space Harrier 2 on the Mega Drive or Genesis. The Master System exclusive Space Harrier 3D utilised Sega's Sega Scope 3D glasses. Space Harrier 3D is a game in which the Space Harrier must find the missing Uria, who is heir to the throne which will end the plans of a tyrant who wants to corrupt the land of the dragons. The player must defeat an evil captain at the end of each stage and after completing all the 13 stages the player will then need to fight the captains again, one at a time in order. After that, the evil king personally tries to prevent the player from stopping his tyranny. Space Harrier 3D on the Master System boasted all new stages and challenges and the added bonus of True 3D once again leapt over the dimensional barrier that sprite based games continually bounced up against. You could also play on standard 2D mode using a code after you beat the 3D game. However that's a little disappointing if you didn't have the 3D stereoscopic glasses and you wanted just to play the 2D game. Now we're on to Space Harrier 2. Space Harrier 2 is the sequel to Space Harrier, developed and published by Sega. First released on October the 29th, 1988, it was one of the original launch titles released for the Mega Drive in Japan and one of the six Sega Genesis launch titles in the United States the following year. Space Harrier 2 was meant to mark the new console's superior ability to deliver the arcade experience. I found it interesting and a little bit risky to note that Sega used an original sequel to promote the arcade prowess of the Genesis. Not that anyone really minded, and although the majority of the market continued to plug away at their NES consoles, Sega fans gleefully ate up the new game. And what do I think of Space Harrier 2? Well, nothing's really changed for the second installment, and the Harrier still races forwards towards hordes of speed and enemies, with his jackhammer looking weapon still clutched firmly in his hands. Space Harrier 2 made the rounds on several different computer systems, but it is the Genesis version that most people remember. Its smooth scaling and great use of colour was a big step up from previous home versions. There were gamers who were quick to complain that it was a much easier game than the first one, perhaps too easy. I mean, it was possible to blow through on the hardest setting and still have a good supply of reserve lives left. Did this ruin the game? Hardly. The action was still as intense and the gameplay this time designed around a gamepad as opposed to an analogue stick was solid and natural on the controller. Even on the low difficulty, Space Harrier 2 is still an excellent title that should have a place in any Genesis fans collection. And also like Altered Beast, Space Harrier 2 features digitised human voice recordings during gameplay and is also an example of some of the Mega Drive's early sound. Ok, let's continue looking at the Genesis Mega Drive game of Space Harrier 2 and then we're going to look at all the rest of the ports.
Get ready. Get ready. Get ready.
Get ready. In December 2000, 15 years after the original game's debut, we see the release of Planet Harriers into the arcades. Presented by Sega. The game was published by Sega and developed by its amusement vision division. This game also runs on the brilliant Hikaru board, which is basically a modified and upgraded version of the Naomi hardware. You could play the game either in a sit-down twin cabinet or also a stand-up single cabinet. I totally love the twin cabinet, which allows for two seated players to play simultaneously single player games or a network two player game. Wow. Planet Harriers continued the gameplay style of the franchise, but featured four new selectable characters, each possessing distinct weapons, in addition to five fully realised stages and a new option of purchasing weapon power-ups. Once you select one of the four characters, either Glenn, X, Corey or Nick, then a character flies from an into-the-screen perspective, shooting oncoming enemies and missiles. There are a few additions over the original formula. Control is through a joystick with a missile and bullet trigger and view change and bomb buttons on the main panel. You can lock onto your enemies similar to Panzer Dragoon by sliding your fire cursor over multiple enemies. You can also actually purchase power-ups in a shop for increasing your lock-on ability too. Despite these additions though, you'll be at home with Planet Harriers in an instant. The game just looks beautiful. Everything in the Planet Harriers world is constructed from polygons, from the characters to the backgrounds to the little power-ups. You won't see any pixelated foliage zooming at you this time around. The game draws far into the distance and only seems to obscure upcoming terrain by design rather than by necessity. And I have to say, the image quality is at a level you'd expect of a power VR derivative. It's clean and it's crisp. Everything moves at a constant 60 frames per second. It is pretty smooth. The added power of the new arcade board is also evident on the speed of the gameplay. Planet Harriers is a fast and an intense 3D shooting experience. There are so many objects moving around on the screen at the same time. I was worried if I could possibly keep up, if I'll be honest with you. Such a buzz of a game. The graphical style is just amazing for everything from the backgrounds to the characters to the monsters. There's something almost magical about how your character soars through the sky and also when the player hits the ground and starts running. Great animation, let's have a look.
You're approaching the boss. Well, there you go. That was my video covering the history of Space Harrier and all the associated ports and sequels. I hope you've enjoyed my video. All in all, Space Harrier's had a great run for a franchise that essentially only has four real installments. It's true, Sega has certainly milked the first title to the breaking point. Hopefully, we will see the rise of a brand new game. Any new Space Harrier's got to be a good thing. I mean, come on, Sega, it would be a crying shame to let it die, and I would really love to see Harrier soar once more. By the way, whatever happened to that young fella, that young developer called Yu Suzuki? Well, he went on to develop and publish an army of brilliant games after Space Harrier, and I have to say that I am a massive fan of the Yuzuki games. So many of his games have set new standards in both our arcade and also our home video games. All of his games gave a truly amazing experience and I have certainly covered many of his games in my videos too. Hopefully you'll check them out. So Yu Suzuki, I have to say spot on, you're Sega Steven Spielberg, you're a legend. Okay folks, that's a wrap. A big massive thank you for watching my video. Please remember to leave a comment, press the like button or better still subscribe to my small YouTube channel. I've enjoyed playing and collecting video games from the early 80s right up until now and I hope to share more and more of my gaming experience with you all, so please subscribe. Until the next time, thank you for watching, take care everybody, bye bye.